we're having a conversation with Dr. Peter Betke, and he is uh, author of Living Economics. Um, Dr. Betke, where does your passion for economics come from? Well, first, thank you for uh, you know having this conversation with me. I um, I got turned on to economics at Grove City College by an outstanding economics professor, Hans Senholtz, who was my principles of economics teacher. And it came in the late 70s, and I had experienced the gas lines that, that had uh, plagued America. Um, so at that time, there was rationing of gasoline. So you had to wait online for an hour or whatever to get your tank not even filled, but even just $5 worth of gasoline. And I went right from that right to college. And I wasn't expecting to like economics at all, but Senholtz explained how and why the gas shortages existed, the policies that were connected, and then the economic laws that were involved. And I was kind of like, you know, snapped on. And then it just, from that time on, I started reading all the things that Senholtz had suggested and, you know, Henry Hazlitt and Mises and then Milton Friedman, because Free to Choose had just come out at that same time. Um, and so I just was, you know, continually turned on by all the great thinkers that, you know, grace the syllabuses of this university, right? You know, Hazlitt, Bastiat, Mises, Hayek. Friedman, you know, and so just was an adventure, one adventure after another, you know, after that, yeah. You, you have mentioned all these names that we at UFM uh, respect a lot. Yeah. We, we cherish them a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have a favorite? Ludwig von Mises. I mean, I'm thrilled that I'm in the Ludwig von Mises library. I mean, I'm like a kid in a candy store when I come to UFM. Uh, so Mises is my favorite economist of all time. But I have a whole bunch of other ones that are, you know, not too far off. Hayek being, you know, of course, one. So, um, but, uh, and then I respect different economists on different margins, you know. So Milton Friedman is someone who I admire tremendously for his ability to communicate basic economic ideas so forcefully and clearly to the masses as well as his ability to communicate to scientific peers, to his students, to policy policymakers, and then to the public. And I don't think anyone else has rivaled Milton Friedman in, as an economic communicator across all four of those levels. And you have mentioned communication, which is totally important. Yeah. Uh, why? Well, I, I think that if the more that we believe that these ideas are truth, okay, the more effective we want to be at communicating the ideas to a public who is either ignorant of that or has special interest to not believe the truths of economics. And so our ability to communicate across audiences is very important and that's a two-way street right there's a sender and a receiver of any signal and so you have to pay attention that you can't just send the signal as if there's no receiver so you always have to pay attention and be mindful of audience and that's one of the reasons why Friedman I think was so gifted was because he always related his ideas to the audience and found a way to communicate them with that um, so I'm, I think it's a, a skill to aspire to achieve yeah for for a student who may be interested for a student of economics or a student from other sciences who may be interested in communicating yeah. what would you be your recommendations well i mean i think it totally changes depending on you know the uh, the age and the context of communication in that age i mean um, it used to be the case that uh, you know, being a journalist at like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Times of London, you know, that would be the pinnacle, Washington Post. And so you would try to be a journalist at those areas. But now with the rise of new media and the ability to circumvent a lot of the standard old uh, sort of institutions, blogging, Twitter, you know, whatever the latest thing is that I'm, I'm too old hat. I joined Twitter a month ago and people were like, yeah, Twitter's about ready to die. So, you know, I'm a lagger on this. The young kids know how to communicate in amazing ways and we need to make sure our ideas find an avenue, uh, you know, a, a venue in that new, new media. And so I think that's really one of the more exciting things that's happening um, is the opportunity for people to circumvent the traditional, more ossified institutions of media. Yeah. What about literature, movies, theater? 
Yeah, I mean, look, the reality is, is most people react to stories that affect some emotion in them rather than their head. And we economists, you know, we're a discipline that's focused on analytics. You know, we're, uh, you know, we're the sort of uh, cold, cool, calculating, you know, folk. That's what we do. And so as a result, people a lot of times don't want to listen to the message because it seems like it's not sensitive to the stories that people you know, want to hear narratives that they would like to construct for themselves. And so I think the more that uh, people that believe ideas of economic freedom and, and of classical liberalism can relate the stories or themes of that through literature, through movies, through poems, uh, whatever, we're going to be better off. I mean, you know, one of the classic examples is people used to ask this, uh, the question, why aren't there any folk songs? for libertarianism. Why are there folk songs for socialism but not for libertarianism? Well, we need more folk songs. We need more popular media efforts to be able to do that. I'm, I don't have a comparative advantage in that. So I have focused all of my energies as trying to be an economist and an academic economist at that. So I'm not that good at communicating to the general public in the same way that, say, other people are. I, I respect it. I admire it. I don't have the kind of ability to tell an emotional tale the way that some other people do. My son, who helped me a tremendous amount with this book that you're talking about, Living Economics, and he's an artist. My son is an artist and, and a he's writer. A music. Yeah, he's a musician, but he's just basically an artist in general and also a writer. Um, and he's studying mass communications, actually, but mainly he's living his, his uh, artistic uh, ideas as well. Um, but he really helped me tremendously with this, with this book. Maybe kids like him, you know, he's 24, so maybe he's not a kid anymore. Young men like him, they will become the communicators of a lot of these ideas, or whatever ideas, right, are going to need to be communicated through this new, new vehicles, um, you know, new ways of expressing yourself that relate to whatever the current generation is that's coming up. I'm still stuck in, you know, trying to communicate the way that people did in 1200, which is, you know, I read books and I write articles about books and then I write books and then I put them on dusty library shelves in the grand hope that someday in a library 500 years from now, one of my books might be in a rare room library like here, you know, that's, and that's sort of the way that, you know, professors have been doing things since 1200. And that's the world that I, that I work in. But I recognize that not everyone either has patience for that, nor do they, you know, find that all that compelling. And so if you look through the history of, you know, the last 500 years or more, you know, where novels, for example, have had a tremendous impact on the way that people think um, about the world. Nar narratives, you know, the, the Bible at some level is a fundamental narrative. If we take the spirituality aspects out of it for a second and just talk about it as a piece of literature, what it is is it's a narrative that touches on people's emotional suggest right you know it, it touches their heart it's their story that they tell about what we who we are what we might be all that kind of stuff right and economics you know hasn't that's not its comparative advantage <laughs> its comparative advantage is you know the analytical sharp you know it's like mathematics you know but there's a beauty in it and you know i try when i you know teach economics i try to get the students to think about the beauty that's in the analytics. Well, it is yeah. about human action also. Yes. How yeah. can there be no beauty in yeah. free human action? Yeah. No, that, that's what I try to get them to understand. I, I refer to it as the mystery of the mundane, you know, the idea of a sense of wonderment that goes on in things like a supermarket or just in a normal bazaar, right? You know, if you, if you come into a town and you see a normal set of trading you know, circumstances, the tremendous division of labor, the negotiations, the art of human cooperation, all of that's there. And so what I try to do when I teach, especially the younger students, is try to get them to see the wonderment and the mystery in the things that they take for granted. Like when they go to a store and they simply buy a pair of shoes. You know, where did those shoes come from? You know, how did that guy know how to put those shoes on that shelf? How did that, you know, uh, farmer, you know, so far away decide to, you know, raise, 
you know, cattle, which then becomes part of the leather, which then, you know, becomes part of the shoes. So telling that story and that whole division of labor and human cooperation in that, if I can get students to be excited about the mystery of the mundane, I've, you know, have won half my battle. Now, once they're like, wow, how did that ever happen? Then you can bring in all the apparatus of economics to help explain, you know, that and, and, and get to the answer. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm very excited about, you know, future, like I said, with my son, like Matthew, I mean, he, he could really, you know, um, he'd be better at answering your question about new media and ways to do things. He, he, he not only is he an artist, but he also organizes art, right? So, you know, he runs shows and other kinds of things that other artists come around and, you know, go to. And he, I think they do that all through new media efforts. I mean, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand, you know, how he does everything, but it's like boom, 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 and then next thing you know, they got a concert going on, and, and so it's, it's, or a show, you know, and it's, um, you know, I, I, I would love to see the energy that my son puts forth towards music and art. I would love to see people on our side put it towards advancing the cause of economic freedom and, and, and libertarianism, yeah. Finally, if a student approaches you uh, with something like, uh, Peter, I, I, I want to do something about poverty. Yeah. I am, I, I, I cannot see poverty. Uh, it offends me. Yeah. What should I do? Well, yeah, so remember what I said that about me being the scholar on the dusty books from 1200. So, you know, my immediate reaction to that is, okay, well, now let's study economics even and more so that you can understand the causes of poverty and where, and, you know, what are the ways, best ways to alleviate it by studying economic history, uh, studying institutions of a free society, the things that are the causal factors for po poverty alleviation, and then teaching that to other people, and then teaching that to more other people, see? And that's the way. But that model is different. You know, one of, there's a very legitimate argument, which is that if a kid comes to me and says, um, you know, hey, I really hate poverty and I want to fix poverty, I should say to them, be an entrepreneur. You know, be an entrepreneur, build a business, you know, and then all of a sudden that business will actually be able to hire people that otherwise aren't being hired and therefore you're going to be ended up by taking those people out of, you know, poverty, right? And so, you know, the, you know, one of the best things that can happen for the poor is to have a growing economic pie, right? To have the economic pie and what, who's the generator of that economic pie? Wealth creation in your society. It's entrepreneurs not scholars, right? You know, so at some weird sense, you know, the message that I give is the message about becoming a scholar, studying economics more, and I, I love that, and I think we need more and more economists out there, but the economists aren't the ones that translate into the jobs, they're the ones who translate into understanding, you know, and if we're fighting a battle about society and understanding, I agree, but, you know, a very legitimate thing would be start a business, Hire 10 people in your neighborhood, you know, that are not, you know, and work with that and build that business up and give economic opportunity for people that previously don't have it. And, but in a lot of the societies where you see horrible poverty, it's precisely because there's a lack of understanding, right, about the, the cause and effects in economic life that has regulations and laws that prevent that very person from going in and starting the business or raise the cost very high for them to start the business. So that's why I justify in the end why we need more economics professors, uh, you know, and we need to be teaching more and more economics and spread the word about economic liberty and the science of economics and what it teaches us. And uh, so ultimately, I don't think I'm too far off the track. You know, if I take a kid whose passion is understanding poverty and poverty alleviation, and then I can discipline that with the understanding of economics and economic history, I think that that will work in the end towards a world with less poverty. Does that make sense? That's, right. that's what I'm trying to do, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank oh. you very much, Peter, okay. for sharing these ideas with yeah. us. And thank you, too. <laughs>